Gentlemen, you are listening to the world's most dangerous creative. Our guest today is a legendary creative who, in the vein of such giants as Archie Shep and Ordette Coleman and Albert Eiler, has pushed the envelope of what music and what pop and moto jazz is. He's pretty much carrying the culture on his back right now having made over 200 albums and recorded and collaborated with the likes of Max Roach, Taj Mahal, Amiri Baraka, The Grateful Dead, Saul Williams, The Roots, Gregory Porter, The Plum Projects. He leads the World Saxophone Quartet for over 30 years, 40 years, pardon me. Pretty much, he's going to realign the uh, Brave New World trio and come May, of uh, this year, his new project, Francesca, uh, will be available for mass consumption for us to listen to. Please welcome uh, to the show, David Murray. Yes, sir. Thank you. Cap it up. So I, I have to say, and I, you know, I've said this to you before. Your biggest champion is no longer on this plane with us, but you know, I came to know you because of my manager, Richard Nichols, who. Before I even met Richard Nichols, Rich was like the guy that you listen to on like the free jazz station in Philadelphia radio. And he would constantly play levels of spiritual and free jazz that I'd never heard of before. And he would play your records. And even though Rich was talkative, like I rarely heard Rich talk passionately about things. Well, only because I mean... Rich was passionate, but he was also like profane. to know Rich is very extreme. <laughs> so, well, very he was profane. part of that crew, you know, the, uh, the Empty Foxhole in yes. Philly, Temple University, um, WRTI. He was mm-hmm. part of that whole crew that uh, that accepted us with open arms during that time. I mean, I was playing as, I was playing with uh, Sonny Murray at Trey's Lounge and hanging out in Philly, you know, doing those kind of gigs. Yeah. Um, I'm, I had some very early days in Philly because, you know, I, I came out from California and um, and people like Richie, you know, they, they, they kind of helped me settle. And Philly was almost like a second home for me because I couldn't go home, you know, because I was 3,000 miles away. And I noticed that a lot of cats in New York, they go to Philly and because they felt warm because that WRTI family, Richie and, and, and all the people there, Ludwig Fam Trick, even he, that was after, he was after, but... Uh, People like that. Uh-huh. So I'll say like a month after I met Rich, we had our first music arguments, and by music, really mainly jazz arguments. And, you know, the thing was, I was going to school at a time with a bunch of young lions, like Christian McBride, Joey Dean Francesco, Kurt Rosenwinkle, like all these cats who are like now today the establishment. And like in order to get those guys respect in high school, there's a certain language you have to speak. And of course, because those guys were younger, they kind of went to the route of where Winton was leading jazz and the way that Rich would just come down hard on, like, no, man, like, I know you think. And he had to put it in ways that I can understand, which, you know, at the time he was like, basically, this that you're listening to is would basically be like what bad boy is like <laughs> how people think you know there's a there's there's a sect of people that believe that that's not the true it's real hip hop son yeah real, real. hip hop and you know some people that wouldn't know better is just like hey that's hip hop and i was like well give me an example of what you think it is and pretty much like he just it was important to him that he sort of reprograms me to understand your level of artistry and once I fell inside that rabbit hole, I couldn't get out of. And it's, it was always Rich's sort of opinion that because of 
what he saw as the one step forward, 30 steps backwards progression of where jazz was, was like, okay, we only want to hear bop this, this forties bird level of bop and really not move forward. Like he felt that you, and also the M bass movement, Steve Coleman, Greg Osby, like people really pushing the envelope should have been way, way like, he's like, he's a modern Coltrane. Like he's, a living, walking God amongst us. Do you ever tire of that kind of fan worship from jazz enthusiasts? Because even when looking up your press, like the Village Voice gave you artists of the decade in, in the 80s, you know. Um, well, that's because, you know, Stanley was talking to Stanley Crouch. He talked a lot, and, and Gary, and, and Gary <laughs> oh. getting listened a lot, what he said. Stanley wouldn't stop talking, you know. <laughs> so I know that Stanley Crouch was. He your... claimed he was the sixth best drummer in New York, <laughs> and everybody knows that that wasn't true. Right, right. <laughs> so you know, he said he said a lot of things, you know, and uh, when him him and Winton hooked up, and uh, that was a kind of a, a stormy situation, I'd say they became some kind of jazz police or something like that. Right. So that's the thing. How do you? What put him in that position where he? Was that authority figure? Was it Robert Christigal giving him that much leeway at the Village Voice? Well, he was my English teacher in college, you know, at Pomona College, in okay. California. I mean, he had a, he had he had probably one of the most uh, um, popular courses on Herman Melville uh, there. Herman the Melville. Time. Herman Melville, the guy who wrote Moby Dick. Okay, okay. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so he's a writer, you know. So uh, and he um, he's the kind of guy that would. Uh, he gave me a card one time that had his, his his fingers in a boxing glove on typewriter, and that was his business card. You know, so like, <laughs> you know, him and Ishmael Reed called me up one time and said, "Hey, man, your boy Stanley's going for the championship." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so Richie knew all. He knew about all that. Richie knew all, but Richie was also fighting against that because you know a lot of. Uh, Richard could see through all that bullshit. I, was he that volatile, though? Because I've heard stories of, uh, you know, before he passed, Greg Tate told me a story of, like, Stanley will be in the, the Village Voice, like, having arguments of music with writers, and then it goes to pugilism levels. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Tate, I, I like him, too, but I remember he wrote an article about me trying to get trying to find his place, too. He wrote an article about me in the Village Voice called David Murray Half Stepping. What? Really? Yeah, yeah. And when I seen him, I talked to him about it. You know. Hey. Are you on? I want to. I'm gonna approach it. I'm approach yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. I talked to a lot of people. <laughs> you talked to a lot. I of talked people. to Winton too. I mean, I talked to. I, I you know, I, I wasn't scared. I was going to say, have you ever had a conversation with Ward me Marcel? and Winton had dinner not so long ago? It was wonderful. Look, we buried the hatchet. Okay. Whatever hatchet there was, we buried it, and. Come to tell you the truth, and I mean, I, maybe I shouldn't even talk about it in, in depth the way I usually talk about things, but, but uh, Winton is a brilliant young man. And I just remember the first time I seen him in Branford, I went to New Orleans when the World Saxophone Quartet started. Kid Jordan brought us down there. Okay. And we played with the uh, London Branch and uh, this great drummer, I uh, forget his name. It was a pharmacist from uh, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I seen these these two young men, um, Winton and his brother. They were in this in this class of kid of kid Jordan and mm -hmm. uh, bright eyes. They looked brilliant. Next thing I know, uh, somebody had said we was against each other or something like that. I say, but well, that's that young man I seen there in in high school, which was great. Uh, you know, there's an article that was in a paper in Paris. Um, okay, they um, translate all the great articles around the world, um, different issues into French, and they put it out in a, in a magazine. You could buy you could see it. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, they had a thing that said, is this man destroying jazz? They had a picture of Winton, and then a lot of articles was about me and Winton, right. and the, the argument that we had back and forth and back and forth. But finally, in the end, man, you know, Winton has done some very beautiful things. Uh, Lincoln Center, Albert Murray's, Stanley. I mean, they've created a, a, a wonderful uh, situation, and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that for anything in my life. That 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 never would have been me. I I, mm -hmm. I didn't want that job, and I'm glad that he's brilliant enough to do it. I have an 
an interest in in this only because I see the the parallels between because we do this a lot in hip hop culture. Mm-hmm. You know, the really first generation that was raised on hip hop. We're just around the corner from being senior citizens. And, you know, a lot of us are looking at those that were born after the 2000s trying to make sense of, like, is this hip-hop if it's not? My general agreement is if I don't like it and it makes me uncomfortable, then they might, they must be doing something right. something, yeah. Yeah. They're doing something right. And arguments are good in situations Mm -hmm. like this because, you know, like we say um, among the communists, they say, well, it keeps you sharp. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Arguments keep you sharp. For hip-hoppers... 1997 is kind of that that year in which uh, really the, the the shift of hip hop changed to where we kind of are right now, which you know is neither good nor bad because I've heard music that I personally thought, ah oh, man, that's classic hip hop, and I'll return to it, and it'll just be like, eh. Mm-hmm. That song was all right, mm-hmm. <laughs> but and you know, and there's there's production now that's way better than anything that came out, you know, in the last decades. But in jazz music, I was led to believe that you know the path that Miles Davis was sort of laying down with, and you know, even though people make the most out of bitches brewing on the corner, like the idea of like free jazz and coloring outside the lines is Miles wasn't just the only one. However, you know, something happened in the mid '70s in which a lot of his musicians had to find other ways of making income because of his dependency. And a lot of them started saying, hey, let's just write pop tunes, whatever. And so a lot of his people sort of had to go into other areas of music, which left a gap open. And I guess the perception was that, you know, when you, when did you make it like your first record? Like in 78, 70? Uh, 76. Right. So when you arrived, then I guess the perception was that you are going to pick the baton up and lead the charge, and then out of nowhere, jazz goes back to the 40s that made people feel safe, like the bop movement suddenly returns. Like, in your mind, where did you feel that you were creatively in 76 when you're making your debut? Well, you know, prior to that, I, you know, I, I grew up in the Church of God in Christ, and my mother Koji. was a piano oh, yeah. player. Really? And, uh, and like, yeah, yeah. She used to be at Ephesians Church and then Missionary Church of God in Christ. You know, all that old oh, happy days. She was part of that, all of that. You know, um, so I grew up. I mean, I remember the first thing I remember about music. Uh, I'm three or four years old, and she's trying to learn how to how to play the foot pedals on the organ, and I'm making a game out of it. You know, because I I wasn't old enough to go to school. You know, so next thing I know, I got a saxophone, and I'm nine, and uh, you know, I, I took it to church that night and started playing. And Reverend Daniel said, "Oh, I see, young David's got a new instrument. Uh, he sounds quite spirited, you know." And I was playing shit like. I would aisle it in, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing, you know, but now I do. So um, anyway, so when I came to New York, I had played a lot of uh, blues gigs. I played with, uh, you know, I, I played back up to bad singers, uh, R&B, played in Richmond, you know, behind different singers, Tyrone Davis, different people come through you town. You played with Tyrone Davis? Yeah, come through your town. What other commercial artists have you played with? Uh, the new Monics. I mean, a lot of people. I mean, everybody in the Bay Area, you know. Okay. I, I mean, I, I I was in horn sections, you know, mixed mm-hmm. company. I went home to uptights and different people, you know, people like that, you know, organ players, different people, you know. I mean, uh, I, I grew up in church, you know. So, <laughs> I, so when I came to New York, I kind of put all that stuff away to kind of get into this uh, new music movement. So uh, when I got to New York, I could tell you, uh, we used to play down the studio, we and different studios, and and I, I I knew a lot more than a lot of the cats around me. I mean, there was a lot of cats that were playing the horn real hard and long, and but I grew up playing the saxophone. I I didn't just pick it up, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had history inside in my sound, you know. The horn has always been my best friend, and I, and I was an athlete, you know, so I I could play the horn and I could play it with uh, power. And uh, I use circular breathing for power, not for a long notes, you know. I, I get louder as I play. So anyway, I'm just saying, 
I scrapped all of what I learned in my teenage years and early years to come into the avant-garde because I, I knew Bobby Bradford and I knew Arthur Blythe. Uh, I knew Wilbur Morris and Butch Morris and, I, and I, I met all these people that showed me how to go into this area of music. But I had already learned a lot of stuff before I met them. So when I came to New York, um, it was easy for me to navigate somehow because I, I had this history in my young self. I had this, all this history already inside of me. Were you aware of the perception? Like I always thought that, or I was under the impression that New Yorkers kind of looked down on California uh, musicians, jazz musicians. Yeah, because they all because a lot of the, a lot of the jazz musicians from California, uh, they end up playing that smooth jazz in L.A., and I couldn't stand that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, so it's valid. I couldn't stand it. So I, and when I came to New York, I wanted to play. I wanted to play hard. I mean, I heard. I mean, I was like coming out of interstellar space with Train and I, Rashid Ali. That was like that's what I wanted to do, kind of stuff like that. You know, I mean, I, I met Sun Ra and hung out with him and I met Rashan out there. You know, I met Sonny Rollins, you know, and I wanted to be like those guys. What, what was the first stop you in your track moment when you realized that the saxophone could go way past Stan Getz or just someone that, you know, was more melodic and really didn't come out of lines? Like the whole spiritual jazz movement, because... Even then, there's still this talk of like, well, is this jazz? Is this? Well, when I heard Coleman Hawkins play, I, the possibility of the tenor, it, it, it really, the way he played it was endless. I mean, it, to me, he was playing avant-garde, just pressing his notes, you know, d doing those standards, playing body and soul and all that. Um, the way his rhythmic approach was, I mean, everybody that plays the tenor saxophone copies Coleman Hawkins. Yeah. Was uh, Ornette Coleman, was he someone that you listened to? Was of course. Where? Yeah, of course, that. of course. Yeah. I mean, Bobby Bradford used to play with Ornette. So oh, we wow. talk we talk in LA. When I when I passed through LA, I was in Pomona College and I, I never really spent that much time in LA. I was mostly on campus, you know, and then I came to New York on the independent study. Um, and then uh, I was uh, instead of continuing with my sophomore year, I just kind of just started making records. And the next thing I know, uh, I hear I am sitting here with you guys, <laughs> <laughs> um, just like that. Oakland, California has a rich, deep history of black musicianship. Yeah, tower and whatnot. power, yeah, yeah like yeah. Sly and the Family Stone, everything. Uh, I, I miss Sly at church. Really? Mm -hmm. When? When I was a kid. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, we went to Vallejo to some, you know, they always have these uh, um, pastor's appreciation times, you know, <laughs> one church goes to another and they raise yeah, money they for raise the pastor money. and then they reciprocate, you know. It was one of those kind of deals. That's what, that's, that's what I, I met him in the pulpit, you know, up there with the band. Okay. Mm, yeah. I didn't know who he was at the time, but yeah, I mean, I, now that I look back on it, yeah, I met him. Mm. What was your acronym, Koji? Koji? Oh, Kojic. Kojic, yeah. Church, yeah, church of God, God in Christ. Christ, yeah. Kojic, so what, yeah. Like, what denomination is that? Is it? My mother was Tremaine's godmother. Wow. Um, we used to take baths together, me and Tremaine, Tremaine Hawkins. 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 Tremaine, okay. Tremaine Davis. Okay. Tremaine Davis. Who, okay. Which, who became Tremaine, Tremaine Hawkins. Hawkins. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. Uh, so, we lived not far down the street from Ephesians, so a couple of blocks from the park there in Berkeley. So, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with these people. Was know. there any point in your life in which you did? desire uh more of like a commercial route i mean the music of junior walker the music of you know my mother passed when i was 13 okay. and um three years after that my father remarried uh, to verna and uh, she said i just love that bernard johnson he just he just really loved you know the saxophone player bernard mm -hmm. johnson that's the name okay. right and he's got a story you know he's, he's got that thing tremble in this it's beautiful and he said David, you can't never do better than him. <laughs> it's okay. I says, all right. I love Bernard too. I'm not gonna. I, I'm gonna leave that to him. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be the gospel guy. No, no, that ain't gonna be my thing. No, no. I couldn't wait to get out of church. <laughs> 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 but it, but it was a beautiful experience. On the other hand, 
You know, but I'm still with God, but I'm not. I'm not. No, nah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, believe that. Assuming any time that you played in church, were you allowed to even go to that level of? Not then. Okay. It, it was different then than it is now. I mean, when they, when they started rocking it, I mean, I the church that I went to, I remember they, women. I, I remember the big thing was kulaks when they could start wearing yes, kulaks. Come on. When they could start wearing kulaks <laughs> to the to uh, to. to uh, Sunday school picnic and whatnot. Right. See, that was a whole nother time. See, yeah. now they have dances that are gospel. You know, my my people in Texas, uh, you know, they they have gospel kind of dances where they they dance to beautiful hip hop. You know, gospel hip hop, and you know, it wasn't like that before. They, women couldn't wear jewelry. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it was a lot of things that you couldn't do during that time. Then the music just blew up. And then people started realizing that, oh, these Kojic musicians are very, very good. So Kojic is the same, like Baptist Church, Kojic Church, they both rock out. Like you said, as far as musically, they both just get the same, get down the same when it comes to... Well, my brother right now, my brother, uh, he's, a, he's a Kojic musician. He plays piano like my mom and directs choir. Mm-hmm. He, for instance, he plays at three Baptist churches okay. every Sunday. Okay, okay, That's, that's okay. what he makes his money on. Okay, okay. And he runs choirs. Some churches, I'm not going to knock on any religions, some churches just don't, they don't have the musicians that um, a Church of God in Christ seems to generate. That's, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, okay. You, you, <laughs> check, you check Andre Kraus. See, Andre, Andre, first of all, Andre and Stanley are first cousins. Did not know I that. I figured, because oh, wow, I'm okay. like, why do we See, have two this crouches? this is stuff we want to know about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Look at the way both of them walk. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so I got okay. Anyway, they're both dead now, so uh, I'm not talking about nobody. Oh, right. right. No. So, but I'm, but I'm saying. Oh, Stanley Crouch, the, the, Andre Crouch. Yes, yeah, I said the yeah. Crouch. How many so Crouches see, could it the, be? See, the, in California at that time, there were two bishops. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bishop Cleveland and Bishop uh-huh. Crouch. Uh-huh. Yeah, one is in L.A., Cross in L.A., Cleveland's in the Bay, on Alcatraz in Berkeley. So, yeah, there we go. And that was their daddy. Yeah. Wow. So wow. strong, strong families, very strong. Was only uh, continuing your studies your main reason for the, the move to New York City? Yes. I got a state scholarship to, to play music, um, to study music at Pomona College. I met James Newton, and he... I had to play flute because I, you know, during that time you couldn't major in John Coltrane like you can now. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had to play far A to get in uh, college on the flute. You know, really. So okay. yeah, I had to put my tenor saxophone over there. You know, and so I started playing with the Arthur Blythe and Stanley and Mark Dresser and and James Newton and James Newton hooked me up with the flute and you know, so I could get in and do all my my entrance exams and all that, because I had won a state scholarship, cause I, so I could have went to school anywhere I wanted to in California. I went by Stanford, and uh, it was bland. There wasn't nothing happening over there. I went to University of the Pacific, there wasn't nothing happening there. I went to a lot of colleges. But Pomona, only reason I went there was because I met Stanley, and I met Bobby, and I met Arthur, and I met all these guys who ended up coming to New York. And I, when Arthur came to New York, I wanted to go too. So I figured out a way to get this independent study thing so I could get to New York. What was it about Stanley that drew you to him? Like, was it a constant thing of one-upsmanship or, you know? Well, I also wanted to be a writer. And I was impressed by his writing. Okay. He had written this book of poetry, um, Ain't No Ambulances for No Niggas Tonight. Mm. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Bob Thiel put it out. Okay. Anyway, you know, and I was interested in all kinds. I was writing poetry. I thought I could be a writer and a musician. And, uh, yeah, in fact, I did my senior thesis on, on Stanley's poetry book. You know, after a while, after I'd known Stanley for a couple of years, I had to get away from his aura. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean he was a, a good friend, very mm-hmm. good friend. But... Um, when he hooked up with Winton, then I had to put some distance on that that whole thing. Um, and, it, and it's just the nature of things. I mean, I used to hang out with Albert Murray a lot. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, I wasn't welcome anymore. I don't know. It was kind of getting a cold shoulder over there. Yeah. So what was your practice at your height 
the times when I was doing everything else, I was just practicing. I mean, I just kept a horn in my mouth. I don't, I don't even know the hours. It's probably way more than that. I mean, I just would have the horn everywhere. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, when you're, when you're in your, in your teens and twenties, until you have kids, <laughs> you know, that horn is it everything, everything. You know, <laughs> and then sometime when the kids come, they go to some of your practice hours. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's just life, I guess. Now, my son and I, we play, we play. We play. We we spend a couple hours a day every day playing bebop. Just going over because I'm trying to uh, impart a lot of things to him. Shout out to Mingus. Yeah. Yes. So um, you know, to, to to my son Mingus, you know, and uh, he 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 could play the guitar, but he he wants to know everything now. He's like a sponge, and uh, I'm just glad that he's ready for it because he's he's played with me mm-hmm. uh, in different settings and uh, w- w- with my octet and with uh, different bands. But now he wants to go inside because uh, I always uh, thought you know jazz is the black man's music, and jazz history is so short. You got to know all of it. Huh. Why you not? Know, it's a short history, yeah. and you go you know go back to James P. You know. Go back to James P. and get all that, you know. Get everything, James P. Johnson. Just, just, just go back and get all the, you, you know, you be played. Go, just get everything. Jazz is such a, a short and rich history. We can't just learn one era of it and think we got it all. We can't just copy people's solo and think we got it all. You got to go back to jazz. I mean, I know bass players. Um, people talk about jazz before chord changes. Mm. I mean, guys have been playing jazz for a while. They didn't even know what to call it. <laughs> You know, so uh, I'm lucky enough to, to have known some of these musicians that are gone, dead and gone now. But uh, to go back and, and talk to people like I was, I was just, just talking about Dexter Gordon, Johnny Griffin, you know, go back to people who really, this guy Remy, what's his name, uh, James Remy, James Remy mm-hmm. uh, from Texas, the bass player. He's talking about jazz before it changes. I'm like, wow, you know, a friend of Steve McCall, you know. Do you feel as though we're in danger of what they say losing the recipes? Perhaps because you know, but jazz is blues. You know, hanging around with Taj Mahal, so he's a student of of the blues. You know, and he's probably one of the the older, significant blues artists out here still. Mm-hmm. So um, we got to go back when we talk about going back to our roots. We got to deal with the blues too. You know, and, and most great jazz artists. There's a lot of blues in what they do, you know. Duke Ellington, you know, Count Basie, there's a lot of blues up in there. You know, you go back to Jimmy Lunsford, there's a lot of blues up in there, you know. I mean, it's, it's what makes us different than other bands. Like, if you think of um, some of the some of the more successful uh, white bands in, in the history, the thing that's different about the black bands is there's a lot of blues in there. I think that reminds me of Leroy Jones. Mm. That's what we learned from him. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Like my opinion of musicianship today is that we're doing too much. I would like musicians of my age and, you know, musicians that I see now, uh, there's a lot of overplaying because no one knows how to gel with each other as a unit. But, you know, I also know that there's not often opportunities for bands to even play together unless, you know, if you're in church one day out the week, you're going to do everything but the kitchen sink. But what specifically do you look for in a musician that you know that they have it? Well, it depends on the instrument. It's like the band I have now, Luke Stewart. He's he's, he's starting to be, um, become one of the well-known bass players out. He reminds me a lot of Fred Hopkins. Okay. You know, I mean, people who really play with soul. You know, I mean. Not just, okay, the education in music these days, I hear a lot of notes, but I'm not sure that they're all true. Um, okay, so <laughs> I hear people say that, and I wonder, like, what set of ears are you listening to that, because I want to know that as well. With a bass player, I, I want somebody who really is there to support me. I mean, there's bass players that, that want to get up in your range and play what you're playing. And that's not that's not what the function of the bass for me the bass is the is is really what swings the band the, the drummer swings the band too but if, with a good bass player it really can happen you know and from the drummer you know just um, today as far as drums have gotten to this point today with the 
or between the, you go, you go from Max Roach, you go to Sonny Murray, you go to Rashid Ali, you go to Steve McCall, you go to uh, you go to Buhena, you go to yeah, different drummers, great great drummers, you know, Philly Joe Jones, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's who I play with. You look for different things in a drummer than you look for in the bass player, but if you put the two of them together, they don't always have to be playing exactly the same thing. It's, it's not like in funk where the bass drum and the bass are playing the same thing, and then people say that's a groove. No, that's not necessarily it in jazz. They have to complement one, one another. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, the bass and the drums are the rhythm sex. The piano is something else. The piano is more of a... Uh, uh, independent in the band. I mean, he he or she colors as long as they don't get in my space. <laughs> you know? Because, see, I've told people, say, well, you know, I've had some great piano players that I've recorded with, you know. Can you imagine having to fire the great John Hicks or having to, having to not fire, but not call back? I never fire anyone. Right. I just don't call them back. I mean, <laughs> how do you how do you say okay? I've had a, a Don Pullen. I've, I've I've done some wonderful things with Don, but after you make a certain amount of records, I don't care how good your band is and how many tunes you write, it's gonna end up being the same record after a while. So you got to change, otherwise, you won't have the longevity that I've had. I I, I mean I've. I played with Randy Weston, mm -hmm. I played with Jackie Byard, I played with John, I played with Don, I played with Dave Burrell, I, I mean, and they all are wonderful, but you gotta keep moving. You can't be stagnant in what rhythm section you hire. Now, now I'm playing with, with, with Marta Sanchez on piano. She's from Madrid, and uh, she brings a whole nother thing in, into the music. Uh, maybe a little more a studied approach than John Hicks, uh, maybe not as uh, as, as syncopated uh, rhythmically as John Hicks or Don Pullen, mm -hmm. but she's heard them both. Uh, so, you know, it's a different kind of piano. I, I like playing with Lafayette Gilchrist as well, and I like playing with D.D. Jackson. That's a whole other thing. So uh, there's a lot of great piano players. This is a, this is a piano town. So you put, the, you put the rhythm section together, and I look for people now that are half my age. Well, uh, you mentioned D.D. Jackson. Were you... Playing with Dee Dee Jackson way before I hooked up with Dee Dee Jackson when I was with uh, Just in Time in Canada, that record company. He was with them too. Did you bring Dee Dee Jackson to us, or did we? I know we maybe did. Rich did because maybe. It, yes, I did. It was me. Okay, I was about to say, how did Dee Dee Jackson was, enter my life? It okay. was me. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I called. I called Rich and said, "Hey, man, I got something for you here." You guys going to do you this classic album. You don't even know. Like you. <laughs> there it is. Nah, that was my gift to Richie you, you and you work, guys. You work with everybody. I mean, if they work with you, then I know they're great. Yeah. This is what I always wanted to know, because I never, it's hard to find any of the albums with them. And it's weird to ask you, like, your opinion on a musician or not. I didn't know that you worked with Alu Dara. Oh yeah, I know of him, but I don't know of him. Well, as we went a on my first European tour. We went to Holland and we did uh, thirty concerts. Uh, and my band was Olu Dara and Philip Wilson. So that's another long story. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Olu Dara is fantastic. And um, then when the Wildflowers thing came, um, when they did the whole Wildflowers thing. Olu was 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 picked out to um, continue on and uh, um, to do a big record uh, mm -hmm. for Alan Douglas. Okay. Yeah, and so Alan Douglas was he produced after after the Wildflower session, he produced the last Poets and also Olu Dara, mm -hmm. and so we were all in a lot of people that was in the Wildflowers. They put a band together and we. We man, we were in the studio for for seemed like months, and we got we got paid some good money during that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't it wouldn't be good money now, but um, we were in the studio for a long time. And Olu was so brilliant; he kept us in the studio, and the record never did come out. <laughs> man. Really? I mean, we must have been in there for months. I mean, and so in my head, I said Olu is a cat because he knows how to run these cats, <laughs> <laughs> and he did. I mean, we were in the studio for months after the Wildflowers. Okay. And the record never did come out. 
They even had Stanley trying to produce. It didn't, it didn't even come out. So somewhere on this earth, there's some They tapes exist, where... some great things. I had a couple of songs. I, I had one tune, The Last of the Hitmen, that they wanted to use. Uh, and then we played the hell out of it. We even had Bernard Purdy come in there for a while. Oh, man. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people, they tried different drummers because, I, I don't know, they tried a lot of different musicians. Probably 40 musicians played on that. On that, uh, well, it, it must have went on for six months. If, if only there was a, 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 a jazz label to. Uh, <laughs> I'm on it. You're, you're, you're literally on it right what now. What year was that? Uh, well, this, this, this track where Wildflowers came out. I, that must have been a 70, oh, 77, 78. I don't, I don't know. You, you look it up. <laughs> <laughs> For our listeners out there, yeah, Oli Dar is uh, right. now his father. Yeah, that's him playing on uh, Life's a Bitch. That's him playing this, the oh, okay. trumpet solo. Olu, Olu is great, man. He was he played my octet, and I mean, I played in a couple of his bands, uh, his okra orchestra. He's you know, you remember when he used to throw out okra? okra? No, he had a what? bag full of okra. And he would throw it out in the audience. <laughs> okra. Okra. Wow, that's an angle I never once thought of. What's the reason for that? Why the, well, his name of the band was Okra Orchestra. Oh, so he, oh. oh, so, oh yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. For the cats that you've played with, and I've seen him, you know, Butch Morris, Reggie Workman, like all these cats that you've played with. What is a good living for a working jazz musician in the eighties, like is the is the purpose to find a unit that will be hopefully picked up to tour the European circuit? Because I would imagine that between May and say August, if you're a jazz musician, you're going to spend your summer in Europe. Well, I have to go back to the eighties to answer that because because during the eighties everything was cash. It was different. <laughs> See. It was cash, you know. I mean, I, I what I did in the '80s was uh, to have my octet and my quartet, and sometimes mm -hmm. big band and mm -hmm. the world saxophone quartet. To juggle all those together, um, I would go to Europe, for instance. I'd have a promoter in Scandinavia to handle Scandinavia. I, I had a guy in in France that did all of France. I had an I had uh, Archie, it's called Archie, in Italy. You know, I give them all two weeks, two weeks here, two weeks here, a week here, bap. And I just say, look, man, you know, I need blah, 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 such and such for uh, for my band. I got to pay my band X amount, thousands a week. And I just, man, it was it's different now. It's not like this now. This one I was doing between myself and Kunle Mwanga. We covered a lot of territory, and uh, we paid a lot of people. That's mm -hmm. what I could say. Um, it was extraordinary. Uh, sometimes we we go to a country, we do six weeks in Europe, we come back and go t into a major club for a week, and then uh, at the end of the week we're in the studio. So uh, people like Reggie Workman, you mentioned Reggie Workman. His, now this is a this is a great bass player who he's always there. He's he's. Um, He's hard work. His, his name suits him because he's a real <laughs> workman. You know, uh, you could depend on him. Then there was Dr. Art Davis. You know, great bass player. Dr. Art. See, he was one of the cats that didn't that didn't want to use an amp. He was from the old school because he could or play wood versus. Yeah, yeah, but you could still hear him. Right. And then, it, and then the word was out that the cats have to start using playing with an amp. You know, and so he was one of the ones that resisted a long time. And I remember going to his house up in Croton, New York, and his wife was uh, working at a hospital, psychiatric hospital, and he started working there too. And she wanted me to give him a salary. It was like she thought, I don't know what she thought I was, John Coltrane or something. I don't know what she thought I was. <laughs> well, you got to pay my husband X amount thousand dollars a year, and I want to see it. I, his kids got to see him go to work every day. You know, like that. And I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. wow. Um, and it was a high amount, and, and I don't know, I didn't know if I could do that. Mm -hmm. That's why he didn't join my band. I mean, he played in my band, but mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I could have paid him that, but I didn't add it all up. I didn't know if I could do it, if I could make that or not. You know, people have demands that they put on me once they see my name in the paper and this and that. Right. And, and I wasn't ready for all that, to tell you the truth. I was just like, you know, trying to, trying to make the ends meet and myself. How taxing is it? 
because of your level of creativity, which I assume, you know, if you're not familiar to people, if you ever see David Murray's name in your town or in your country or whatever, please, like, go, go see this legend perform. But, you know, I also know that for the decades I've known you, you've always led projects, you know. You've led your own trio, quintet, whatever, your orchestra, world tech. How taxing is it to be the business guy, to be the responsible guy for your band, to organize it's things like make sure your guys can sleep somewhere, eat somewhere, that sort of thing, their per diem. And on top of that, be in a mind space that you're still creating. Well, I don't do that anymore. I mean, that was... You used to do it. I, I, you, I used, I like, I used do to it? do it. Uh, it was difficult, but, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time in bars. I don't know how I did it. I guess having <laughs> that youthful energy helped. Mm -hmm. uh, b being able to talk a whole bunch of crap was, was, was <laughs> you know, and, and the whole other thing was I always, in terms of records and recordings, I always had to make whoever was the small company that was going to make a record for me. I always used to have to make them think it was their idea. And then they would do it. Did I mind you? <laughs> Steve, you remember that time we was going to do uh, uh, the Plum uh, yeah. sequel record? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that was my idea. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, it's because um, I asked that simply because, like, if you've seen uh, Quincy Jones's Listen Up documentary, mm -hmm. the thing that actually led him to pop music was the fact that, you know, one... One bad tour, one mismanaged tour could almost put you in a position where, you know, he was get, getting aneurysms because he realized that he was responsible for, you know, a, a orchestra, 30 people. And Tell me about it. Didn't figure in hotels and flights and all those things. And he had to get a day job as an A&R. Be believe me, I, I, I understand. I, and I did see it. I understand. I, one time we went on a tour. We went out west. We went to Chicago. We played Chicago Fest. Kunle, my manager at the time, he got ripped off at the hotel. Mm. The chain maze ripped him off some of the band's money, and we we were on our way out to Denver to play at the Blue Note, and then then they canceled on the way out there. We ended up playing at that the Buddhist place out there in Denver. The guy at the Peace Church in New York on, on 9th oh, Street and 2nd Avenue. Nike. No. No, no, no. It was, it was, a, it was a it was a Buddhist place. Uh it, it's a, it's a real Father Divine or No, no, it was a, it was Buddhist. It, it wasn't uh, Oh, okay. It's it's actually a famous place. It's like in a temple. Colorado. A temple. In Colorado. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, anyway, we, we we swung around and we went to California. We came back around Texas and we played at the place our net was associated in Dallas Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And then we came to New York. When I got back to New York, <sighs> Oh, the band fifteen thousand uh, dollars, and during that time, it was like you know some money, and and I, so I had the Monday nights at the Sweet Basil, so I was paying the cats on the back door from the tour, and the cats on the stage, I, I was juggling. It was hard. Robin <laughs> Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, I was robbing Peter to pay Paul, and, and I and I finally got it off me, you know, because I couldn't have that reputation. I mean, I mean. We could blame some of that on those chambermaids at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was rough, man. I mean, it wasn't easy just doing all that. But now I have help, you know. Uh, my, my wife, Francesca, she's been very helpful over the uh, over these last few years to Mars, our anniversary. Oh, the namesake oh, for the album, yeah. for the yeah. project, right? He yeah. Named it after yeah, so, so now she does a lot of my business, and she doesn't want to because she has her own Thai business going on. And, uh, and, it's, and it's starting to pick up, and I, I'm going to have to f find some, some new agencies, bigger agencies to deal with so we could um, kind of manage it a lot better you know but uh as time goes on it, it, hopefully it'll get easier and easier so i could just relax and deal with music so what's the climate now for the jazz musician again living in europe in the early 90s for me jazz jazz music everywhere like the roots ourselves were essentially just jazz musicians we were doing all all those festivals, which we've done a lot with you. Yeah. 
however, you know, I know time moves on. And when time moves on, something might get lost in the rear view mirror. So what I would like to do now is more or less um, do less but more substantial gigs and have time in between. I, I don't really want to do the 26 nights out of 30 <laughs> if I could help it. Of okay. course, I will if I must, but um, I like to have the luxury of being able to play somewhere at a nice festival and wait a couple of days and three days and then play at another one and you know, move around a little easier. But uh, you know, sometimes the demands uh, you know, change that idea. I don't need all the gigs. Mm -hmm. There's gigs that I come to me that I kind of pass off to other people and say, yeah, well, one time I did a, I had an article came out in one of the papers, Times or something, they said, big fish in small pond, you know. When, those, when you get those kind of articles, it just makes you say, well, what am I doing? I mean, one time I seen a picture of myself and I had I had this, this triple-breasted suit, you know, and finally, finally the lapels is pointing at the camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, this, oh, you're working too hard, man. <laughs> I, I had to see that picture to understand that I was just draining myself. And see, James Bud Oldman told me, says, you know, David, you know, there's a lot of cats playing saxophone out here, but you might be the one of the only ones that's free. Mm. And, and that's what I want. I just want to be free. Mm. I want to mm. be free in my music. Um, I don't want to be a bebop player. I don't want to be an avant-garde. I want to be free on any music that I play. At least for you, uh, where you are now, what's the easiest lane for you? And I'm asking in terms of, I would assume that if you're doing bop, that it's more about your, your scale knowledge. But when you're doing your free jazz, like you, your physical stamina has to be, I assume, in tip top shape because you're blowing the shit out that horn. So for me, the most challenging thing is to have, is to play freedom on top of everything, with everything, and, and be part. If I'm playing bebop, I want to play bebop and I want to be in it and I want to be above it at the same time. What if, if I played with Bob Weir the other night at the Apollo mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jamala Dean, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a wonderful Jamal show. Jamal Dean, Jamal Jamal Dean. Dean. Tacoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. yeah. Shout out to Jamal. And, and that, that, that benefit they had the other day. Right. And it was a wonderful show. But I pride myself in bringing freedom into any kind of music. When I played in church, I was free. I, I got it to the point where nobody cared after a while because they liked what I was playing. I think every music has its difficulties. I love bebop music. My special gift is to be able to play any kind of music because the more music that you learn how to play, the more people you can play with. When I did the Nat King Cole in Espanol and we played at the Sal Playel in Paris with Omar Patundo and I wrote a string arrangements, had 10 strings, 12 strings, uh, and a five-piece horn section and Omar Fortuna. Man, when we finished that show, we, would, we was ready to go to Vegas. <laughs> that was probably as commercial as I could probably ever be. But at the same time, I'm playing freedom. And see, that's what's special about me. And I've been criticized for it, but that is my credo. I want freedom in everything I do. I think our listeners might be curious about the Philadelphia Half Life um, ap appearance of Dave Murray oh, in '96. Yeah. We were trying to figure out if we were going to make a "Say What Man" a running joke on every Roots album, but for the first four years, like the idea of Tariq freestyling and scatting to each instrument on stage was like one of our ways to pass the time. On you know, like, <laughs> all right, we got three hours to do a That's show. That's David on "Say What Man." Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying oh. that we, you know, we did it on Organics, and then we did it on Do You Want More. Oh, I didn't. Okay. And Rich was like, well, let's do it on Illadelph Half-Life. So we were doing it, but, you know, Tariq was kind of in his rebellious stance of, hey, all that jazzy stuff is now in the rearview mirror. Like, I got to... I gotta earn five mics in the source, and this ain't it. So oh. we we tried, and then it just fell, kind of fell apart. But 
It's so weird. Like you, you've done so many gigs. Something that might mean something to me, you might forget about. But one of our first years at the Tonight Show, I remember we did a gig. You, me, Vernon Reed, Ornette Coleman. Uh, Out in Brooklyn. No, no, no. We we flew to uh, London. Oh right, right, right. At that, yeah, right. at that on when they did that festival when they featured right. on there. Yoko Ono was like the, the yeah, the, Yoko, the free yeah. jazz madness. That's right. <laughs> like so literally, that's right. All I remember was that this was like maybe the fourth month of Fallon, and it was a Friday show. We did the last of the note, and we didn't have time to like even run and change our clothes. Like we ran straight to the airport in our show clothes. That's right. I remember that. Got off the plane in our show clothes, went through customs, waited an hour for them to damn near anal probe us, and then (laughs) go straight to the venue and rehearse like three hours or so. For you, though, can you talk about playing with Ornette Coleman? Because I kept asking at the time, like, are we going to rehearse with him or is we just play? He's just like, no, man, we just play what we feel. Yeah, I remember um, because when Arnett showed up, we were doing a we were doing like a sound check, I guess. And Arnett, he didn't want to do the sound check, but right. so he had he had me check his mic. Yeah. <laughs> and so he gave me a lesson right there while checking his mic because he had a very particular way he wanted the shrillness of his horn to to come out. He says. Yeah, man, do your saxophone like that. I said, no, that's okay on that, but I got, I got it, though. I got it. I got it. Because uh, I, I was always friends with Arnett, and, and he he cared for me, uh, you know, because I knew Bobby Bradford, of course, uh, and, and Charles Moffat. Mm-hmm. You know, they all go back to Fort Worth. But, uh, yeah, Arnett didn't need to rehearse because Arnett's going to play Arnett depends on whatever anybody else is doing he's going he's going to be pure on that mm-hmm. <laughs> if he's playing with 13 wells it's going to be pure on that when i was sort of shedding heavy with chris mcbride and some george butler esque uh, george projects they told me getting to andrew cyro Rich actually gave me the record, the Shaquille's Warrior album. Mm-hmm, Could John you talk Twitter. about uh, the making of that record? Because that was one of the first records that Rich was like, study this record. And Or well, Sha- Shaquille's one or two. That's two. The That's one two that came records. out in 91. Okay, that must have been one. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well... Um, that's when uh, when Don we had Don Pullen and Don, and Don Andrew Pullen, Cyril, yeah, and, and, Franks, and, and Stan right? Franks on, on yeah. guitar. He's one of my childhood friends. We used to play with the Notations of Soul when I was growing up in the Bay Area. Okay, um, yeah, we used to back up a lot of different groups. You know, Barbara Tregler, the Mnemonics, uh, different people, R and B. Yeah, so playing with Don because I had done uh, on piano, but when I I didn't understand that he really, it, it wasn't re- revealed to me at that time that he played organ like that. And, you know, mm-hmm. his experience in the church is very similar to mine. Uh, so much soul in his organ playing. And uh, I remember when we did, the, we did the first album, and it was quite successful during that time because we were on a run. Um, uh, we went to Japan. I remember they brought an organ. They bought a Hammond B3, but it was it was one of those very new kind that came with a big manual. We were sitting there at this club in Tokyo, and Don didn't even get up. Don wouldn't even open the manual. He, he said, that organ, you could take that back. <laughs> he said, uh, go get me one with some cigarette burns on it. And, uh, give me a <laughs> some, real, some give me a real, on it. yeah, give me a real Hammond organ. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to do that. That's all gadgets and stuff like that. And so they finally bought one, and we played six nights at this club, and oh, it was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a great experience. And when we did Shock Kills 2, that's when Don told me he was sick. Okay. And uh, so that was a different kind of date. But he waited. Don was the kind of cat who would... It was always a wild card with Don. Mm-hmm. He would wait until he got in the studio and start writing a tune. And by the time the session was over, that was a hit tune. <laughs> it was always the number one tune. 
Uh, he had a, and, and, it, and it was a way, the way he dealt with things. Uh, very private man, very, very deep reader. He was a real reader. I'm a reader too. Mm-hmm. You know, you could, uh, in jazz musicians, we don't have a lot of people who may be readers, but, I, but you could sense the, when you're around these people, the conversations we had on the road and, um, very deep thinking person. Reader I, in terms of philosophy or you're talking about? Notes. Notes, notating. I'm, I'm talking about philosophy. Philosophy in life, okay. Uh, no, just books in general. I mean, I mean, I, I try to make sure all of my children are readers, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you could tell a person who reads and a person who doesn't read. I mean, you know, I mean, that's part of my growing up. Is, I mean, I, I was heavily influenced by a lot of writers. I wanted to be a writer, like I said before. Yeah, okay. And you're highly educated, too. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, so it's important. It's important that. And, but it, he was that kind of a person. And, you know, John Hicks, too. Um, you know, when you're around people like that, it just kind of inspires you to uh, to know that you're on the right path, perhaps, you know. Um, um, you, you have accomplishments that you want to make that are personal to you. And uh, you have to keep your mind uh, filled with many things, you know. Yeah. I mean, like I'm doing a blues project with Ishmael Reed, and it keeps me a lot of times uh, when I, you know, I always always go to him when I need some inspiration in terms of words, and, uh, you know, I have my favorite writers, and I constantly read. You uh, mentioned earlier, you talked about Sun Ra. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a singer that uh, in his orchestra, June Tyson. Yeah, I knew June. Yeah, talk about her. She was, I loved her voice, and um, oh. what was she like? Oh. I used to love her. I, I I loved her, and I loved her space dancers too. Cause <laughs> Verda Mae Grossner, you know, uh, Mickey Davidson, uh, Cheryl, um, some wonderful uh, people around Sun Ra. I mean, uh, when I met Sun Ra, I was out in California, and they played at the Transcendental Meditation, some kind of place on Telegraph Avenue, and mm. he started talking to Butch and I, and we closed the joint. I mean, it's three o'clock and everybody's left and he's sitting there he's sitting there just talking to me and Butch and just his philosophy. You didn't say much back to Sun Ra. You said, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, right on. Word, you know. They weren't even saying that then. But you know, I was like, wow, man. It's, and he take you to many places. So uh, he, he always hit on me to play in his band. I was like, what time he always hit on me, I was like, no man, I got a family, man. I can't do You're that. trying to get paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'll if if you can mention like what would have been a bad gig back in the day, on that level, like nah, it's shaky. He doesn't pay his musicians. Or... Oh, a bad gig. One of those gigs where nobody shows up doing loft jazz. Sometime you know, sometime you'd be very successful. Loft jazz was basically on the door, mm. and but. When you were successful, yeah, because um, I used to uh, I used to have some skates and I had a backpack and I had a tape and I had you know things to put posters up everywhere, and I got pretty good at it. If you got a voice choice, you got a little thing, a little blurb in the Times, you might have a packed house. So people started uh, giving me their flyers and uh, I, and I, I became an emissary for. Uh, like um, you know, loft jazz, so, and, and so. But a bad gig would have been when you didn't get a voice choice, or something happened right. technical like that, and you didn't get the publicity out. But most of the times, when you did, you would get the returns. But every once in a while, it would come up flat. Were you friends with Robert Christigel at the Voice? Not really. I knew him. Well, he was. A, a, I, I knew him. A major fan of yours. Like yes, he prob- was. No, yes, he was. No, I, I knew him, but I knew him mostly through Stanley. And uh, there was the guy at Soho News. Uh, there was another, there was other people that I knew very okay. well. Chris, Chris Gow was not in my generation, but but I, I knew him. Of course I knew him. I, I knew everybody. Well, I'm, I'm obsessed with his writing as a critic. And, you know, pretty much all of his choices on jazz or whatever. Like, you're always at the top of his. Yeah, I so mean, that's, he, that's he, Stanley's he, he was influence very, on him. He, Probably in Gary Giddens too, I would I would imagine. But Chris Kyle, no, he knew what he was doing. He, he knows. Were there he, critics that irked you? And that was, it was uh, Peter Ocho Grosso. Oh, from man, the he was <laughs> they had receipts yeah. <laughs> ready. And then uh, then there was uh, you know the guy at the time. It's just, um, 
Um, anyway, people come and people go, but I knew most of the critics. Uh, okay. I mean, I can remember all their names. But, um, you know, every once in a while you get blasted. I mean, I did a couple of string concerts. I got blasted a few times, yeah. But, but, it, but it made me go back and do a better job. David, we were talking about tunes before. Like, how much of your day is spent actually playing and practicing versus sitting and writing, composing? Like, what's the... How does that? How does You'd your day rather work? be practicing right now than talking to us. This man, absolutely. <laughs> but like, because we were talking about like the actual physical art of writing a tune versus just playing. Well, I, I, I'm I'm kind of like, a, I guess I'm taking a break because I just made this album, and uh, when I'm making an album, I, I usually come up with maybe a, a 12, 13 songs, and I gotta whittle it down to seven or eight maybe. Um, so the, the, during COVID, man, uh, I wrote so many tunes. I, uh, I, 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 I throw them away like airplanes. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it made no sense to write for a big band during that time because we couldn't even get a trio on the stage. You know, I have, I have a lot of big band um, music and orchestra music that I've written that there's no chance of playing it um, during this time. Uh, it would be great to have a, a resurgence of big bands. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, those times are not... I'm lucky to get a quartet on stage, you know? You mentioned your desire to to write. Do you have any of your things on manuscript, or like have you written pieces? Writing in terms of fiction, I, I, I assume that you're saying when you wanted to be a writer, you're... Oh well, that was when uh, I was I was uh, in high school in my first year in college. Uh, I, I don't even, I don't even know where that stuff is. Um, okay. But as far as uh, I didn't get that far. You you want to know because when I because I, I, I had written a um, my senior thesis in high school about mm-hmm. Stanley's book that I was telling you before, mm-hmm. and so when I went when I met him, I gave it to him, and he. He read it finally, and he gave me a B plus and threw it mm-hmm. on the ground. He said, "Man, pick up your saxophone." And that was the end, almost the end of my writing <laughs> career. <agree. laughs> so I, I kind of got discouraged at that point, you know. So, but uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway, I'm close to the writers is what I can say. What? Michael Nash and Kerry Williams and uh, Taj Mahal and Bob Weir and myself. we we've been we've been working on this uh, this. Um, Musical for Satchel Page for for, oh, man. for many uh-huh. years now. We're finally ready. Mm-hmm. The last time we tried to bring it out, uh, this other play called Damn Yankees came up. <laughs> that was oh. about thirty years <laughs> ago, right? <laughs> Nearly thirty years ago. Okay. So um, I think um, so we've revised it, and we're, we're we're about to make another run at it. Speaking of Bob Weir, can you talk about your forays into other genres? Like knowing that you played with the Grateful Dead. I mean, of course, there's the Bay Area connection that you two have. How long have you been playing with? It kind of start. It kind of started with the Satchel Page thing project. Okay. It kind of and Michael Nash is the one that brought me into it. They gave me a grant, uh, I, and I did a record of Grateful Dead music with my octet. Okay. I don't know if you remember that. But um, it came out, and it was, it was kind of popularized their songs, and they, they had a big laugh about it. And, I, <laughs> and uh, we, I did a gig out at the, at the Fillmore, at Fillmore West, and, uh, and Bob Weir and Phil Les sat in with me, and at the last minute, it was completely sold out. So anytime they play with me, uh, and then I played with them at Yoshi's one time, and they showed up, and it was completely sold Whoa. out. Whoa, okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, anytime anything with the Grateful Dead come up, there's there's so many deadheads in, in this world. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, I played a a wedding one time. Some Grateful Dead fans that just come to me and they put their rings on their toes, and it was fantastic. <laughs> 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 and, they, and they they paid us some money. It was that fanta- is true. It was fantastic. It was a lot of money. It was great. It was out in Martha's Vineyard. Yeah, it was very nice. You know, so these little I've never really got paid to play with the Grateful Dead, but it, things come in different packages. Right. You know, they, the, things from the dead, they come in other forms, you know. Uh, you know, I'll get called for this and called for that. I just did a gig in Washington, some people that knew the dead. Mm-hmm. And I play one for Jerry, man. You know, it's always like that. You know? The gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Okay, so you've done, um, what's the name of the, the project? Uh, Sun Moon yeah. is a solo well, it was project. Him and- 
it was two musicians, right? No, it's just well, it's just it's two instruments, but it's just David. It's uh, he's playing tenor sax pieces and uh, bass clarinet pieces. Yeah. Okay, so when Steve first told me that you were doing a, a solo record, how does one plan for that? Like, because you've done solo shows by yourself before, correct? Yeah, I've made five solo albums. How? Well, <laughs> well one time uh, uh, in 78, I went to Paris. Uh, at the time, Intazaki Shange, my, mm. my, oh, first, my first Cold wife. Girls. Um, you said that was your first wife? Mm -hmm. What? Wait, time out. What? Oh. Wait. You were there pre color Girls? Wow. What? How come I didn't know this? We didn't. Sorry, David. I didn't mean to be sex, sex or surprise. <laughs> I mean, that's cool. That's no, no, that's not pre color Girls. That's 77. <laughs> okay. It's the look for me. Right, right. The look right. right. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Mingus's mom was my second wife. Okay. And Francesca's. Uh, is my fourth wife. A romantic. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And, Val and Valerie in Paris was my third wife. Got it. Okay. So uh, we were doing When the Mississippi Meets the Amazon. I had done music for it. Mm -hmm. And Tazaki, Jessica Hagedorn, and Tulani Davis. They dressed up like Billie Holiday with gardenias, and mm -hmm. they read their poetry, When the Mississippi Meets the Amazon. And it was at the public theater. Um, it was just after we had done photo, a photograph, which I also moved, wrote the music for. Okay. And I had, I had left that show. There were a lot of people in the show, on uh, the band. Uh, uh, Jay Hogarth was in the band. Uh, Michael Gregory Jackson was in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, Farona Clough was in the band. Um, a lot of good people. And anyway, I left the show because me and Intazaki, we were married three months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. But we had, okay. the, we had the marriage of the century, uh, artist marriage of the century in Berkeley, California, at a place called Mapenzi. And the, the, the marriage didn't last long. We went to Maui for the honeymoon. honeymoon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was during the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrecked her Porsche and all kind of shit. Oh shit! <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it was it, it was another time, you know. But uh, I went to Paris and I did a concert uh, at the Theater Mouffetard, and we I did two nights solo there, and out of those two nights solo, we made a record. We sold one to Cadillac Records in, in London, the Red Records in. Uh, Italy and a Marge Records in Paris. So that was my first three solo albums. Organic saxophone, conceptual saxophone, and uh, surreal saxophone. And then I did two other solo albums uh, in um, Florence. Uh, this guy, Checo Mino, that was, a, was a volume one and volume two. Those one that makes five solo records that I made. And then this yours is the six. So doing a solo record or playing a, a gig solo, is that the ultimate freedom, freedom yeah. or is, is it better to have others to, to bounce around and bounce off? When I was younger, I used to set up three microphones on the stage. One over here, one in the middle of the stage, and one here. And when I'd come out and I would play three different personalities at each microphone. <laughs> I did this in London at the Bracknell Festival one time, and I played uh, in front of the Revolutionary Ensemble with Leroy Jenkins and those, those guys. You remember those guys? And uh, Ornette Coleman played after us. And uh, I have to say, I got house. <laughs> <laughs> I, but but it was it was it was, and I don't know how I ca the the concept of using the three um, personalities and three ways of playing the saxophone. The center stage, I only played like ballads. I was like that, you know. On the, on the right, I played another kind of way. Over here, I played a different way. And then finally, as a concert, and, and I would move, and, and I, I was much younger then, and I had these crepe sh shoes, and I could move kind of like basketball kind of moves. I, <laughs> it was more physical than it is now. Uh, I, I enjoyed it better then than I do now. I, I don't really like to play solo now, but... Um, I'm not that athlete, because I used to do decathlon, you know. 
So and and I I won the strength strength competition in the whole Bay Area. I was. Oh, uh, you mean was, for real? You did the yeah. decathlon? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was you know I was good at sports up until a certain point. Then guys got big. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I was really big when I was young. So uh, I'm, I'd say up until 15, I probably was pretty good athlete. 16, but then you know, music took over and blah blah blah. So yeah. Solo concert is a physical act for me. Okay. I mean, I've seen other people play. I'm not going to say any names. I've seen other people play solo, and it's just, like, boring, you know. I mean, it's like, especially if it's one of those head trips, you know. I, um, For me, if you're going to play solo, you got to blow the hell out of it. You, you can't just be like, and then wait. <laughs> like Chicago musician. Then, boop. You know. I gotta tell a joke somewhere in there. No, no, I just <laughs> meant you're the most intense soloist I've ever seen. Uh, so yeah, I, I just can't. I can't watch it. If I can't watch it, how am I gonna do it? You know, I I, I, I can't sit and watch. Like I, I'm in Europe. I see guys play solo in Europe. Europeans, um, black guys, different people. They got this uh, heady approach. It's very intellectual. I say there's only one guy up there. Why, why am I waiting for a note to come? <laughs> I, I don't get it. <laughs> you know, it was interesting when we made this record. Uh, he <clears throat> had some song ideas and some songs that already existed, but a lot of it is, uh, most of it is improvised. He asked me, name something for me to play about, to to write on the spot about. Um, just for example, one of the songs is called Garcia, because we mentioned Jerry Garcia, and then he played for 15 minutes <laughs> expressing himself about his experiences with Jerry and things like uh, along those along those lines so it's fascinating to watch somebody try to attempt that uh, solo experience whether it's on a stage or in a recording studio it's so daring you know you're so can you be more exposed really or you know to to just show your creativity on a when you're all by yourself I don't mind that, you know. I, I work sometimes uh, with this uh, with this artist named Nancy Ostrovsky. Uh, she lives up in the court, New York, and uh, we we did a we did a duet concert, you know, with with a with an action painter. And I've done a few in Europe, you know. Um, one with a uh, with uh, with this uh, brother from uh, Guadeloupe. Um, very interesting to do action. I mean, the action, you know. You, Musicians, I think we we supposed to be some kind of a representatives of our time. We are supposed to be able to not not that we're sages or high level gurus or anything like that, but we should be able to, like a good painter, we should be able to interpret what's happening politically or um, socially around us. We we should be able to. I mean, there's there's many issues. I mean, this is this this is what Questlove does. He's, he's, he's doing that. But maybe they could hear it in certain kind of improvisations. So we got to see him improvise on his own, and then we got to see him improvise with two other people, you and Ray Angry. The most amazing thing was was watching either you or Ray or, or David come up with an idea and then hear the response from the other improv, well, improvising musicians. It was very difficult, too, because uh, to try to keep a melodic motif going and making it up on the spot. I almost was sometimes doing that recording. I felt like I had to write melodies as I was improvising, something that people could hold on to because I, I'm really a true believer of the song form, even though people categorize my music as avant-garde, but what I am is a person who's truly into the song form. Uh, melody is very important to, to me. And what they were throwing at me, what Questlove was throwing at me, it, it wasn't easy. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to translate his rhythms, and then I play something, and then Ray would do something, and then it, it was like a triangle that was happening. I was just trying to keep up with, with what they were throwing me, too. Because it was some, a lot of fastballs and curveballs. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm <laughs> trying to just hang, hang on. on. Yeah, I was just cool. thinking, I was like, so Amir, how did you go in thinking, approaching that? I thing? mean, look, it, it, Steve convinced me to leave the farm. It was still like mid, 
quarantine, right? Like, or at least mm, yeah, towards the end. But yeah, yeah, it was like the the end of it. But still, like, I mean, that's in the air. And then, like, to even be creative in that time period, which is, I think, the real reason why I agreed to do it. I think I would have invented an excuse to get out of it because I think there's a point where maybe after 2004, 2005, I really just stopped trying to chase the dragon of, you know, virtuoso musician and that sort of thing. And so normally I would have said no to that, but I mean, you caught me right in the position where it was like, all right, well, I think everybody was challenged. Yeah. I wanted to get out the house and, you know, just, have fun. So I was like, all right, well, let me make a fool of myself in front of... <laughs> no. if, if David is going to take me serious, then I know it's it's good. And actually, you know, it's... Oh, well, it, was, it was good, clean fun, believe me. <laughs> yeah, no, but, like but, I, but, but I, I shot myself. Too. I will I would love to do it again. We, Part of me also wants to take it live, so, you know. That would be dope. That's what I was wondering yeah. if y'all would ever do that. Live would be fantastic. Well, we're supposed to do some Blue Note shows when the physical product comes in next few months. Well, there we have it. I guess my last question to you before we wrap is, what is the future of jazz? No, I already say <laughs> when people say that. But for you, like, are there any bucket list projects that you'd love to get into, you know, while you're still active? Well, I, I really would like to do a, an opera, if not the Pushkin. See the thing about the Pushkin and the whole thing about the war in Ukraine, and ah, that's, that's, that's kind of too kind of put a damp, it kind of put a damper on it for the moment. But um, I, 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 when I was looking towards Pushkin, I was looking towards creating another um, mulatto hero for black people, mm-hmm. somebody who who was was a, a true poet, and uh, he was part black. So um, anyway, but that and the, the uh, Satchel Page I would like to complete. Um, and I have uh, many aspirations. Um, w- w- if, if I were to be able to get some grants, I'd like to write for larger ensembles, certainly. And when I say large, I mean larger than an octet. Uh, I would like to write for... Uh, I have some orchestra music, and I, I like to. Oh, well, yeah, we can't afford an orchestra at my label, but we can, we'll keep doing solo records. Right? Anyway, <laughs> I'll be happy just to play with my quartet for the next couple of years and uh, see them grow, uh, get ready for this new album that's going to come out, and uh, be on tour with that, and Kahio uh, and Elsa Bar, and uh, a duet, and playing with you guys uh, fantastic um with you and ray oh that would be a dream mm. that would be a dream well mm. thank you man it was, it was a dream playing with you and you know i i am not even though i'm world famous for exaggerating <laughs> statements i still maintain that you are one of the greatest living musicians and i appreciate you for sitting and talking to us <laughs> david murray ladies and gentlemen